Hey YouTube, it's Dwayne here. So today I have Dr. Richard Brash with us today. That's right, the Richard Brash who wrote this book here, How God Preserved the Bible. This is a little pocket book, maybe a less than 100 pages, easy read, but a very good introduction into the topic of preservation from a critical text perspective. What I would like to do is ask Dr. Brash some questions about preservation. And before we get into that, so uh, Dr. Brash, could you go ahead and say hello to the audience? Hi, uh, Dwayne. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for having me on the channel. I've enjoyed uh, watching a number of your videos. I really like what you're doing. I'm over here in Japan, a day ahead of you guys, but uh, it's great to be here and uh, hello to all your viewers as well. Great. Thank you. Dr. Brash, I'd like to ask just right off the bat, like what prompted you to write this book? What what was the impetus for putting the pen to the paper, so to speak? Yeah, well, when I wrote the, the Pocket Guide a few years ago, it came out of some research that I've been doing on historical theology, actually on the 17th century, looking at some of the Reformed theologians back then, some who were involved in the Westminster Confession, uh, others like John Owen, who weren't actually, <laughs> yes. but a little bit later than that. As I started getting into their stuff, I became really interested in what the reform guys in the 17th century were doing with the doctrine of providential preservation. And I came to notice that there was lots of nuance in it. They weren't all saying exactly the same thing, but there were some significant differences to what at least some of them were saying to what many evangelicals will say today about this doctrine. Right. That got me interested in thinking about the doctrine trinal the theological question of providential preservation right right so that that's really interesting because i've had dr jeff riddle on the show before and if, if you had a chance to see some of the stuff you know that he's a confessional bibliologist so that's something yeah, i just sure. learned about in the last year or so so he came on to talk about it and he he goes back to the reformers as well and, and specifically uh, he talks a lot about john owen uh so what what's the link between john owen and and preservation and then second of all how is it that dr Riddle can come to a different conclusion than you. I know we haven't gotten as far as conclusions, but I'm, I'm assuming you're a critical text guy. Uh, you, you're with the, you know, the Nestle Island and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'll let you clarify that first, because I, I think I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Well, uh, fair enough. And I mean, th that's where we're going to get to, I think, as we start to get into my position. Just to say on, on Dr. Riddle, yeah, I'm familiar with some of his work. And actually, when I first started publishing about this, I put an article in the Westminster Theological Journal about 17th century takes on, on providential preservation. And it was interesting to see Dr. Riddle mention it on his website positively. Yeah, actually, you know, I think he and I largely find areas of agreement in interpreting what the 17th century guys are saying. I would recognize from reading John Owen, for example, that he doesn't take the same position that I do. Jeff Riddle actually says in the blog post that he puts where he reviews my article, he says, but why doesn't Brash come to the same conclusion? Well, I've got reasons right. for that, but I'd happily acknowledge knowledge that it's not the same conclusion, but that we can yeah, Dr. Riddle and I, I think, are, are seeing similar things in the 17th century sources. Well, what I think is interesting is that a lot of the doctrinal underpinning of what people like Owen are saying about uh, God's sovereignty, about providence, there's actually quite a bit of similarity there. But I think right. because of the way that texts have been found since then, things have developed in terms of what manuscripts are available and so on, I think the way that I then work out those theological principles about what pro preservation, what providence is, how it's involved in preservation, uh, right. ends up coming down differently. We, we land in a different place. Uh, so I guess the, what, what would be the big divide there? Dr. Riddle, not that I'm pitting you against him, if this is just my, my own thinking, right? Because I've been kind of going down this journey of preservation. So I'm, I'm kind of, I don't want to say middle of the road, but I'm in a position that is neither CT nor TR, right? It's a, mm -hmm. I would say I'm a Byzantine prioritist. Okay. Um, and, and there's a little bit of nuance there, but you know, the future videos, right? I, I guess that positions me in sort of this uh, spot where I can sort of discuss on, on both sides and, and see where they're coming from. So what, what would be the difference between confessional bibliology on the one hand um, and the critical text on the other hand? And I guess, how, how do you, how do the two sort of diverge uh, from the 17th century? Let's start by, by saying, um, here's my position. So in a sentence, God has preserved his written word in the textual tradition of both testaments, old and new, by his singular care and providence. So what, what I'm, I'm saying is this is not linked or limited to a particular manuscript, a particular text family, text type, and it's certainly not limited to a particular translation, at least in my view. And I think this is the key difference. So in my view, we don't tie down providential preservation to a particular text, fundamentally and ultimately because God has not promised to do that. 
that's my view. We can get into that later on. But yeah. I, I do want to say, Dwayne, I think and one of the things I really appreciate about interacting with some of your videos or watching them is that there are many similarities between my position theologically and mm -hmm. some of those other views that you've mentioned. I was having to think about this the other day, and I, I've come up with a few of these. So just briefly, as far as I understand this, or at least as far as I've encountered in debates or discussions with people from different positions, we're all committed to a robust view of God's sovereignty. Right. So we all believe God is in control. We all believe that God has spoken, that he's breathed out, inspired his written word, and that he's preserved his written word in some way. We all believe that God's providence in respect of the text is singular, to use the words yeah. of the Westminster Confession, and that God has kept the text pure. It's just that we, we differ in our understanding of precisely what purity means. We all believe, at least I include myself with those some of those positions that you mentioned, you know, a confessional bibliologist and hmm. the Byzantine text and so on. We all believe in some kind of providential preservation. I think more, we all accept hmm. that there's some need for textual criticism to ascertain exactly what the original reading was mm -hmm. at every point in the, in the text. It's right. just that there's a difference, first of all, I think, on our view of the extent to which that textual criticism is necessary. And perhaps also, as I start interacting with some folks, there's a disagreement on who is kind of appointed or who is allowed to do right, that right. textual criticism. One more, if I can, if I can add in a, a, another Go thing where, you know, where I think there's a lot of agreement. I think that, that basically speaking, there's a, a vast amount of agreement on the question of what the text of scripture itself actually is. And right. the doctrines that that text teaches us, of course, there's disagreement and we can get into that. We need to get into that. But I just think it's helpful. I think one of the things you've helpfully done in, in this channel is just you've you've pointed up some of the great you know agreement that there is there between these positions thank you so if, if we take a look at textual variants um this this is kind of my question i think this is sort of the linchpin uh, at least in my opinion when it comes to determining the text of scripture or, or at least how we see preservation what do we do with textual variants and how do we take passages like matthew 5 18 in every jot and tittle or or psalms 12 6 and 7 that the the words of the lord are pure words how do we reconcile the seemingly a minute detail of preservation with textual variants. So this is a, obviously a huge question. Maybe yes. it'd be helpful to take it in a couple of parts. Sure. So we, we can start by talking maybe about the exegesis of these passages that appear to teach a particular view about the preservation of the text. And then we can perhaps move into the theology later on. Otherwise, yeah, we're yeah. liable to get bought. We're liable to get yeah, Absolutely. Down. Absolutely. Why, why don't we start with the, the exegesis of those texts? Psalm 12, which talks about the, the purity of the, the words of the, the Lord. I think it's verse 6 in English. It's verse 7 in the Masoretic text. This psalm is talking about ethical purity, okay? This is what the word means. It's got nothing to do with orthographic purity or textual purity. So on a purely exegetical level, it's just an exegetical error, I think, to try and get a doctrine of textual purity out of this verse. Matthew 5.18, though, is much more complicated. Yes. But it is, it is still primarily an exegetical question. In other words, what does Jesus mean in this text? That's what we've got to work out. Does the verse refer to the preservation of of textual details, or is the phrase about jots and tittles, in fact, a rhetorical parallel to what Jesus talks about in the next verse, 519, where he talks about the least of these commands. If that's the right interpretation, then it's it's quite possible that's the case. Then again, Matthew 518 has nothing to do with the preservation of text, but it's about the fulfillment of, or the obedience to each and every little command in the law. Jots and tittles might have nothing to do with textual preservation at all. Just like when Jesus talks about specks and beams and later on in the Sermon on the Mount uh, right. in your eye, okay? He's using the familiar language of carpentry, but he's not actually saying anything about woodwork. It's about big things and little things, and he's using proverbial terms. Okay? Right, right. So I, I think it's at least possible, and you know, some of my colleagues will, will take the view that Matthew 5.18 has nothing to do with texts. But I know that Matthew 5.18 has been used by proponents of various views of preservation, some quite yes. different to my view, and some more like mine, to be fair. And most famously, Matthew 5.18 is cited as a proof text for providential preservation in the Westminster Confession of Faith 1.8. Although there is some interesting historical background to that, which is that, as you may know, when the Westminster Assembly put the text of the Confession to Parliament, they, they wanted to put it through with no proof text attached. And Parliament sent it back to them and said, no, 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 we want you to put it in the <laughs> right, proof text. Right, so I didn't know that. The, yeah. the, well, it's an interesting historical thing, yeah. isn't it? But th that's the case with all the proof texts. So actually, the process of what proof texts were chosen, who chose them, 
I'm not quite sure. But it's certainly the case that Matthew 5.18 has often been applied to textual preservation. And that's not surprising because Jesus uses a textual metaphor. Uh, it's a textual turn of phrase and the law is a text. It's more than a text, but it's a text. What I would say about this though is, even if this verse has direct relevance to textual preservation, and I'm willing to accept that it might do <clears throat> exegetically, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that it means what some people think it means or have said it means. L let me try and get into this. So first of all, Jesus' kind of rhetorical point in this verse only works if a jot Okay, so that's the, the Greek letter iota or the Hebrew letter yod. It only works if yod is very small. That's the whole point. And in Jesus' day, it was very small. Yod was the yeah. smallest letter in the Hebrew. It's the same in the Hebrew text that we would look today, printed text or whatever, or most of the, the text that we've got available in, in manuscript form. Right. So the phrase makes sense. But it's important to note that when the Torah, the Pentateuch, the, the books of the law, was first written down by Moses, Yod was not a small letter. It wasn't particularly small. The, the Hebrew text of that period is known as Paleo-Hebrew or Old Hebrew, and Yod just isn't small in the slightest. Uh, it looks like a kind of Z or a Z. What Jesus says in Matthew 5 18 would not have made direct sense to Moses as a rhetorical statement. Right, right. So I guess the, the leading question then would be just to kind of uh, give you a little pushback, get you on your toes a little sure, bit. Sure, sure. What is the likelihood that Jesus would have been reading from a scroll with Paleo Hebrew Hebrew on it instead of like a more modernized script where the Yud is, is much smaller? Yeah, uh, almost no likelihood. So it's a, it's a good pushback. So the, the text right. in, in Jesus' day, just as in our day, Yod was the smallest letter of the alphabet. Well, what we can say from this is although Jesus is using a phrase that makes use of orthographic terminology, yeah, small yep. yod, yes, uh, yep. he's probably not talking about shapes on a page or particular letters because these change over time. We could say that Jesus is talking about not the preservation of particular letters on a page or particular manuscripts, but about the preservation of the autographic text, not as a written entity or phenomenon, but as oh, okay, I see. text. Okay? And if we understand the verse in that way, I think that's a reasonable exegesis of Matthew 5.18. But even if that is the correct understanding exegetically of what Jesus is saying, Jesus doesn't tell us where to find the autographic text. Right. He doesn't tell us in which <clears> manuscripts <throat> it's found. And he doesn't tell us either the precise level of purity that we should expect when we encounter this text in different manuscripts. But no. at, at the same at the same time, just to finish off, sorry, I'll yep. let you come back you in. Go ahead. If we accept that Matthew 5.18 is about preservation of the text, and there's a reasonable exegetical case that can be made for that, then Jesus is then, I would suggest, given us the expectation that the text of Scripture will be or will have been preserved with an extremely high level of accuracy, certainly enough that we can rely on it for life and doctrine. I don't think we need Matthew 5, we need Matthew 5.18 to tell us that anyway, because I think there's a much broader theological case for this. So now if we if we go back to, uh, first of all, your your uh, example from Psalm 12, when you were talking about the words of the Lord being pure words, that they were not pure as in shape of the letters or, or whatever it was, but rather it was pure in a moral sense. So yes. uh, just to make sure that I understand what you mean by that is that when God says thou shalt not kill, that that is a morally pure commandment and that we should not kill. Okay. Or murder. Murder is probably a more accurate term. Whether it said thou shalt not murder or you should not murder makes no difference in the sense of Psalm 12, 6, and 7, because both of those phrases would be morally pure. They're, they're both saying essentially the same the same thing. Is that is that how that worked? Well, I think that's partly right. Yeah. So the, the question of the purity <laughs> of the law in, in Psalm 12 is, as I suggest, ethical. That's what the word means. But the, the question of textual transmission is simply not in the purview of the author right, at right, all. So, right. I mean, we can draw our own conclusions and say, yeah, if there were a textual uh, quest question related to the Decalogue at this point, uh, where, you know, there were some uncertainty about exactly how the commandment uh, was written <laughs> I don't written know. Down. Should, I, should I murder this person? It's textually uncertain. Yeah. No. Well, you've perhaps heard <laughs> of the wicked, the, the wicked Bible. Yes, you know, this yes. was a, a seven, yeah, and uh, thou shalt commit adultery. Was right. the, I have the a way video on that. Was, yeah. Uh, so yeah, this, are, this is a reasonable conclusion for us to, to draw the way you formulated it. Although I, I wouldn't try and get that in any way really from Psalm 12. In talking about 
about the uh, Matthew 5.18 again and, and the Yud and stuff. If I'm not mistaken, the reference there is both to the Yud and to the Yota, the, the Greek letter. Is that a reference also to the Septuagint? Like what, what role does the Septuagint play in, in preservation and how did Jesus and the disciples view view that? Yeah, this is a complicated question. Yeah. And I've always tended to think of it as being a reference to primarily the Yod of the Hebrew text. I recognize, of course, that the apostles are often citing from the Septuagint. I have to say this is because I am not actually a text critic, but a theologian, the yeah. actual questions about this go beyond, go far beyond my field of expertise. Right. But, you know, we, we can lay down some basic principles. I'm not claiming in any sense that the Septuagint is inspired, and I don't think that a case can be made that Jesus and the apostles treated it as an inspired text. But within the, the, the contours or the context of God's providence, and we can talk about, I think we, we should talk about prophecies yes. later on if we've got time. It's quite clear to me that a translation like the Septuagint, and let's remember, that's not a monolith either. You know, there's a textual tradition behind the Septuagint as well. And when we mm -hmm. look at, you know, uh, published texts or texts on our uh, computer screens, it can sometimes lull us into this idea that the that's Septuagint right. is one thing, is isn't. Yeah, God is sovereign over the use of that as well. Mm -hmm.